Okay. Hi, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your practice and your support. Like, subscribe, right? Let's expand this Sangha. Let's get more people to find us on YouTube and liking the videos, subscribing, especially big help. Um, outside of YouTube, those of you who are able to support us, support me, th this channel, us being the Sangha, through your donations, uh, Patreon, PayPal, you know where the links are. Um, you guys are invaluable. Thank you so much. All of us doing Bodhisattva work, yes? So, why do I look so gruff? <laughs> Nobody's asked, but, you know, I see it. I'm doing these videos. Um, you see how I can touch my face with my, the opposite side of my face with my right hand, both sides. When you're shaving, you have to be able to pull your skin, all that stuff. I know this is stupid, but with my neck the way it is, I can't, my left hand just won't go there. Ah, sorry. Anyway, so that's my excuse. Um, <laughs> it's not just laziness. Um, anyway, that's not important. What's important is Nitrin. We're talking about Nitrin. Um, we got some sunlight today, even though it's gotten cold again. Nitrin is in the midst, as we're reading from this author, of figuring out, while he's at Sado, he's figuring out a lot of stuff. It's interesting, his exiles, both of them, upon his return and during, he's, gone, he's had a lot of opportunity to mentate about his commitment, Shakyamuni's teachings, deepen his resolve, but... With each exile, as he comes back, he's really, I think, somewhat stunned at the devotion, the dedication, the, the thirst in regular folks. He's, he started out being kind of an academic, uh, academic, yeah, and railing against the other academics about their foolishness and their misinterpretation and their, their deviations and their avarice for power and politics. And you guys are idiots. You need to be doing this the way it's supposed to be done, right? It was very, his argument was scholarly. It was based on, we've read the Go Show, all sorts of uh, quotations from not just Buddhist uh, uh, texts and uh, and translations uh, throughout the centuries, but also cultural stories, folklore, reasonings, Confucianism, uh, uh, and so on and so forth, Taoism, you name it. He was quite a historian and well-read. So his arguments tended toward addressing those people. But what he found after his persecutions especially, was when he'd return, or even during his persecutions, it was the regular folk, the, 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 uh, the milita military class, the, the warriors, who kind of were a little disenfranchised from those haughty elites looking down their nose at everyone, who, th who saw, heard, and understood Nietzscheen to be somebody who was very down to earth, made sense, logical, appealed to their rational minds. So as a result, as we've read already, most of his converts were of regular folk from the samurai on down to the farmer and his, and his retinue all over the land. They were the ones who supported Nietzsche so now in, on Sado, it happened again in a very hostile environment. He was given a home, fed, protected. So that meant he had to reevaluate his role, right? It wasn't just Nietzschean against the world. It was Nietzschean reaching out, inspiring others to do what? To follow him? Uh, 
It wasn't an egotistical thing. It was a, a righteous thing. Do Buddhism correctly. Any one of you can do this. That was the point from the start of Siddhartha's journey before he even attained enlightenment, yeah? Well, he started to take that more and more to heart. And in the last couple of chapters or readings, videos, we've, uh, we see him grappling with providing for anyone, because that was the mission of Buddhism, no matter what their scholarship, kind of hum, uh, invested in his, uh, or created a bit of a humility in Nichiren, right? Which made him kind of much more soft-spoken to his students, those that would grab on to what he was saying. And without having spent a life in monasteries and libraries teaching themselves, what could give them access to this truth most efficaciously? Anyone, right? Even illiterate, can't read or write. What could I, other than my words, you know, if I'm gone, how are you going to help yourself? How are you going to quickly access this truth? And this, this is what he's pondering. So, as we continue, how to, how to experience Buddhahood directly with some kind of a samsaric, right? There's these people who are using statues and pictures and stuff, but that's attachment. Can't, uh, can't use that device. What does Buddhahood look like? Right? With these thoughts on the truth of mutual revelation and with a special emphasis on the necessity of a simple and concrete representation of Buddha, Nichiren composed the treatise on, quote, the spiritual introspection of the Buddhahood revealed for the first time in the fifth five, fifth five centuries after the Tathagata's great decease. And boy, that's a... Well, that's his translation. Um, I can't recall the actual title or the actual title. This is the actual title. It's just uh, there are better translations, right, that we're more familiar with at least. Uh, better or not, uh, you know. The 5500 year period after the Buddha's extinction would be a, a more commonly referred to way of saying this. More accurate too, I think. He describes the symbolic representation as follows. So this is a quote from Nichiren from that Gosho. The august state of the Svadi Devata, the supreme experience, is this. The treasure tower is floating in the sky over the Saha world. This is, he's interpreting the story of the Lotus Sutra, yeah? Ruled by the primeval master, the original Buddha, Shakyamuni. In the, in the treasure tower is seen the sacred title of the Lotus of the Perfect Truth, Myoho Renge Kyo on either side of which is seated the Buddha's Shakyamuni and Prabhupada or Taho, and also on the sides, at a greater distance, the four Bodhisattva leaders, the Visita Karitra, and others. The Bodhisattvas, like Manjushri and Maitreya, are seated farther down, as attendants of the former, while the innumerable hosts of the bodhisattvas enlightened by the manifestations of Buddha sit around the central group, like a great crowd of people looking up toward the court nobles surrounding the throne. Now I'll pause for a moment here, as I want, as I, I am wont to do. Look at your mandala. You notice some characters, large, some small, some even smaller. 
this is if this has ever happened to you while shodai while you're doing daimoku and you're just focusing on your mandala you might notice that sometimes as you really fuse with your mandala the characters seem to move you can perceive kind of a cylinder or at least a right it's just it's a device painters use and architects and anyone who draws you make something larger it looks closer you make something smaller it looks further back so he's talking about the design what would be the design of a mandala because in the story of the lotus sutra there's a focus on the treasure tower followed by a focus on right seated in the treasure tower are buddha or Shakyamuni and Tahoe Buddhas, so on and so forth. So he's giving every character in the Lotus Sutra its proper representation vis a vis the story of the Lotus, yes? The author continues. In his graphic representation of this scene, Nietzschean makes place for all other kinds of beings. Minds. Beings, again, a verb. Hmm? Men and gods, sometimes we act in accord with great inspirations. Godlike, it's a... It's a very charismatic, charismatic word, God. But if we can stay on earth for a moment, not be taken away by our cultural uh, underpinnings, imagine this is a story about the mind. This is what Buddhism is about. So at times we see ourselves as quite supernatural, don't we? Well, that's God, not some other omniscient being. And, we, and the use of that, is, in, is laced through all the stories in early, middle, and late teachings of Buddhism, right? Because they relate to the stories of the local folk. Spirits and demons, all surrounding the central sacred title. His idea was to represent adequately, from his point of view, the perfect union of the truth and the person manifested not only in uh, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, but inherent even in the beings immersed in illusion and vice, right? Because Buddhahood, Buddhaness, that facility of mind, it doesn't discriminate. It is in everyone and actually everything. It's part of the formations of energy. Whether you're able to witness it or not, that's a distinguishing factor, whether we call you sentient or insentient. But the basic construct of life, obviously, is in everything produced in life. The universe as the engine of life, yes? <laughs> the universe is the stage of mutual participation and reciprocal interaction, which proceeds according to to the truth or laws of existence. So he just said it a different way. Buddha, in his real entity, is nothing but another name for this cosmos of orderly existence. Thank you. This is 120 years before Sylvain saying exactly what I've been saying all along. I don't hear it from many groups and sects out there who are driven by politic membership, raising funds, hmm? organizations. What comes first in an organization? The organization. At what point down the hierarchy does the member get any attention other than a source of support? Hmm. Be very wary getting involved with organizations. So, the organization you and I are part of is the universe. Mm. Seen from this angle, 
The truth is fundamental and the person is secondary. Yeah, our ability to wake up to what's going on isn't the progenitor a distinct difference from anything like a religion. Because if you've studied anything at all, you know that religions rely on fantastical creations of man. I know they don't say that, but <laughs> don't look behind the curtain. But the truth and its laws cannot exist nor work without everlasting wisdom. Everlasting wisdom. You can't deny the process of life. I mean, you can, but how ridiculous do you look? <laughs> life is happening with or without your opinion. Right? Which ordains all laws and causes all beings to exist. We are a product of the potential in the universe. Not the other way around. I know there are some, even physicists, who will argue about the anthropic principles. You can look that up if you like. That the whole universe exists in the way that it does because they're somehow our minds pre-existed it and ordained it to be so, so that we could be here. Oh boy, that's a really stretchy argument. <laughs> it starts going magical, mystical, right? That's the whole God as creator. Buddhism, we don't need a creator. It's, not, it's, it's nonsensical to think of a creator. We, if you need to use that word, we're the ongoing creators moment to moment to moment but how much how much are we involved consciously with creating whatever man creates is generally ephemeral yeah it's our karma it's energy if you need a creator that's the only thing you can point to is energy but the energy doesn't create so much as provide ferment for things to instantiate, right? Potential doesn't create. Potential creates an environment for things to happen. And they're happening moment to moment to moment, and they're dissolving as well, right? Things arise, abide, disintegrate. That's how all life works. It's just that simple. So there's no need for somebody cooking up the broth. It just is a process. And it's happening. And we have this golden moment to observe it, to appreciate it. It's kind of a relief. We don't have to worry about things coming out of nowhere. Right? Right? like a bubble in a sudsy bath of bubble bath. Each bubble doesn't really worry about where uh, all the other bubbles have come from. It's just a bubble for however long it is. I just reduced human life to a bubble. <laughs> Buddha, the, the, the law of this truth, of this process, as he declares himself to be, in the second chapter of the Lotus and the timelessness of that formation of the universe reveals himself in the 16th chapter. Not so much himself, but Buddhaness as existing throughout not only time, but timelessness before Time, after time. Time is this construct. It's part of this construct of life. How could there be life without time space? Time space, you could put another slash in there, right? I was talking about how time and space are different aspects of the same thing. Well, so is life. See, Westerners were not used to thinking that way. But it's a triad. There we go with three again. Time, space, life. They all are interdependent and can't exist without the others. 
That very fact is Buddha. Do you see? The father and master of all beings. Again, that sounds like a relationship with a person. But it's not. It's a relationship that you and I have with the very function that is the universe. Time, space, life. This Buddha has appeared as is made known in the chapter on the apparition of the treasure tower in the person of two Buddhas, Shakyamuni and Taho. And this celestial manifestation was meant to show the efficacy of Buddha's wisdom to lead all beings alienated from it to the full enlightenment of the universal truths. So, without the word salad, the opportunity to realize for one's self in samsara, in the physical world, in the universe, this deep abiding connection we have to the process of the whole thing. Uh, I'll give you a visual. Think of yourself as a galaxy. A what? Yeah. How many stars are in this galaxy, this Milky Way? What is it? A hundred billion? A hundred million? I don't know. The numbers get ridiculous, right? Let's make a smaller example. Think of yourself as a solar system. Well, what's a solar system? It's a star surrounded by planets that are orbiting it. Well, if there's a hundred, let's say, let's be concerned. Let's a hundred million stars in our galaxy. How many of them have orbital planets? Some one, some 10 That's John. That's Edna. That's Pradeep. All these solar systems, they're just people. The processes that drive this solar system are no different. Down to the quark than your body. I know, I sound like I'm talking weirdness. But seriously, think about it. Just thought experiment, okay? When we look at the night sky and we say, look at all the stars. It's a pretty high level, superficial statement, isn't it? It's like saying you're up in a helicopter, or a satellite. And you're looking down, right? You ever gone on a tall building and look at all the people, they look like ants, right? When you're looking at that distance, you don't see Bob, John, Ted, Alice, right? You just see peoples. No different than looking at the stars. The same processes are at work. See, we like to individuate, right? It's that identity thing. It's the self, the ego. I am so different from you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not. This is what people find the most difficult to understand about Buddhism. Because that's not how we're taught. We're taught about these magical things mystically going on. And we all have our own little worlds and responsibilities and identifiers. And of course we're all different. <laughs> what a joke. It's hard then to have to come to terms with a philosophy that says, uh, no. In fact, your differences are the problem. The differences are what make you miserable because differences mean you don't fit. He doesn't fit. She doesn't fit. 
this, <clears throat> this tension. It's unreasonable. Buddhism, as you're hearing him talk about this story of the Lotus Sutra, this, these differences just dissolve. We each and every one of us are the treasure tower, just like the universe is the treasure tower. There's no difference. The basic truth of existence and its everlasting laws are inherent in every being, existence, experience. While the personal manifestations of Buddhahood are working to bring all beings to full consciousness of their own real nature. Isn't that exactly what I was just saying? In other words, all beings participating in the primeval wisdom of the universe, the process of life, the universe, are developing their proper nature in conjunction with the educative activity of the Buddhas, the realization of Buddhaness. Taking this view of the cosmic movement, right? I'm always talking about momentum. The supreme experience is nothing but the union of the truth and the person. Your sentient mind can realize this truth. It's not your truth. It's not his truth. It's not her truth. It's the truth of all phenomena. as realized in the person of Buddha and to be realized in each and every one of us. This union is now graphically represented in the cycle or mandala in the center of which the truth stands, surrounded by all kinds of existences. Namo myoho rengekyo, right down the middle of your mandala. And the cycle, which is this, right? The cylinder is the means to inspire our spiritual life with the truth of the mutual interaction and to induce us to full participation in the universal harmony. It's like a wormhole, a vortex, a focal point to blow you into the entirety of the universe. Science fiction fans, can you not see that? It's not about words and identities. It's about the components of the Lotus teaching and a focal point for us to penetrate that, that portal in our minds, that Gohonzon portal in our minds that <laughs> realize the process of the universe, life. You Star Trek fans should enjoy that analogy. It's right here in the mandala. And the cycle is the means to inspire our spiritual life, our spiritual being mind, right? Seen in this light, the object of focus, the supreme experience, is to be sought nowhere but in the innermost recess of every person's nature. Because the final aim of this dedication, this practice, is the complete realization of the supreme experience in our samsaric selves. Duh. Ethically speaking, Buddha is our producer, father, parent. But metaphysically, Buddha and father is the means of perpetuating truth and life, which are to be made actual by us. In other words, with that realization, we can then act upon it. That's the benefit of a sentient mind. We're not just tumbling through life. We, with sentient minds, can interact with the truth, can make causes, take thoughts, words, deeds, to just to, to explore 
the largesse of the treasure tower. And of course, that very act is energy being put into our environment. That's why we influence others. That is the Bodhisattva mechanism. Do you see? Buddhism is very simple. There's a lot of words wrapped around it, but they're all saying the same thing. Now, these two sides are united in the act of Buddhist practice, which is, on the one hand, a, a commitment, an adoration, a, a conviction, a resolve in the universal truth embodied in the person of Shakyamuni, and on the other, the realization in thought and life of that Buddha nature in each and every thing. Every one of us, certainly, humans. These principles of ethical, metaphysical, and religious teachings were formulated by Nietzsche in a further exposition of the conception of the supreme experience in an essay called The Reality As It Is, written on the fifth month, June, that is, between the composition of the spiritual introspection and the revelation of the graphic representation in the mandala. This conception of the Buddha nature and of its realization in ourselves through practice are consequences of the time-honored theory of the threefold personality, the three kadya of Shakyamuni, right? The manifest body, reward body, dharma body. There's that triad again. But the characteristic feature in Nietzsche's ideas is that he never was content to talk of abstract truth, but always applied the, t the truth taught to actual life, bringing it to, into vital touch with his own life, right? Remember, Nietzsche lived Namo Myoho Renge Kyo in his cellular self. It wasn't some praying for outer forces to somehow give me, give me, help me. No, no, no. Nietzsche understood Shakyamuni's teaching wasn't about mysticism and magic and hoping for beneficent gods and other forces. Every time he even used that kind of rhetoric, it was about finding it in the mind, in the self, in the experience of life. Nowhere outside of your own sentient mind does your enlightenment happen. That's why there's always this exhortation to study, to learn, to find your own insights within all of the teachings of everything because that's how we inculcate truth. It's as simple as tasting cheeses. Here, try this cheese. No, 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 it smells like old feet, <laughs> right? You'll never know what something tastes like till you taste it. No matter what the verbs, adjectives, colors, whatever somebody tells you, you don't know something until you do it. Buddhism is no different. Nobody's trying to convince you of something we... Because there's no proving that. There's no, everyone can make up their own fantasy. But you know when you're engaged in fantasy, it's not real. You know this. Cellularly, you know this. Buddhism isn't about storytelling. It's about what the storytelling is forcing you to look at. Something deeply equanimity within everything that's truth hmm? where are we time wise okay ethics and metaphysics are never to be separated but to be united in the practice and the practice means a life actually embodying the truth and virtue Truths are revealed and virtues inculcated 
in the Lotus of Truth, the Lotus Sutra. And consequently, the true Buddhist life is equivalent to, quote, reading the text by person, experiencing the lotus within the body, the manifest Buddha body. Experiencing it is the reward. What are you being rewarded in experiencing in this body? The Dharma, the truth, the actual experience of life, not a bunch of frills and monkey mind, look over here, right? Just truth. Thus, the essay, which begins with discussions of the metaphysical entity of Buddha nature, proceeds naturally to a consideration of the Buddhist life, especially as exemplified in Nichiren's own life. In it, he says, quote, I, Nichiren, a man born in the ages of the latter law, have nearly achieved the task of pioneership in propagating the perfect truth, the task assigned to Bodhisattva Visista Karitra. Right? He's identifying as embodying the spirit of the teachings of the leader of the Bodhisattvas of the earth. He's saying, I, I'm actualizing that teaching. Not I'm an incarnation of. But as the story is told in the Lotus Sutra of this self-realization, I identify with this lone character as he's uh, one of the four leaders of the Bodhisattvas of the earth, which that's future Bodhisattvas, which is us. The eternal Buddhahood of Shakyamuni, as he revealed himself in the chapter on the life duration or the lifespan of the Tathagata, in accordance with his primeval entity, the Buddha Parabhutatratna Taho, who appeared in the treasure tower, in the chapter on its appearance and who represents Buddhahood in the manifestation of its efficacy, the Bodhisattvas who sprang out of the earth, there it is, as made known in the chapter on issuing out of the earth, in revealing all of these three, I have done the work of the pioneer among those who perpetuate the truth, too high an honor, indeed, for me, a common mortal. I, Nichiren, am the one who takes the lead of the Bodhisattvas of the earth. Then may I not be one of them? If I, Nichiren, am one of them, why may not all my disciples and followers be their kinsmen? Are we not all Bodhisattvas of the earth? Is what he's saying. Obviously, if we all have this core capacity of truth of Buddhahood, then are we not all bodhisattvas? The, 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 the Lotus scripture, the teaching says, if one preaches to anybody the Lotus of Truth, this sutra, even just one clause of it, he is, know this, the messenger of the Tathagata, right? He's spreading the truth of Buddhism or Buddhaness. The one commissioned by the Tathagata and the one who does the work of the Tathagata. How then can I be anybody else than this one? Look at my life. Look, how, look at the very function of life around me. This is quite a quotation, goes a long ways, I don't think. I'll read a little more. By all means, awaken your resolve by seizing this opportunity. Right? Isn't that what you're doing? Live your life through as the one who embodies the truth and go on without hesitation as a kinsman of Nichiren. Be the Bodhisattva that you are. Just take it on. Own it. If you are one in resolve with Nichiren, again, emulating his life, you are one of the Bodhisattvas of the earth. 
If you are destined to be such, how can you doubt that you are the disciple of Shakyamuni from all eternity? How can you doubt your relationship with Buddhaness? From time without beginning, you are unified with the engine of life. There is assurance of this in a word of Buddha, which says, quote, I have always, from time without beginning, been instructing and quickening all these beings, end quote. No attention should be paid to the differences between men and women among those who would propagate the lotus of the perfect truth in the days of the latter law. To utter the sacred title is indeed the privilege of the bodhisattvas of the earth. Could it be any plainer? I'm going to pause there. We'll continue reading Nichiren's this quote of Nietzsche in the next video. So I don't want to tire you out. This, this author, I think I give him credit for doing a good job of really illustrating for us Nietzsche's progression. And, and lately in this part of, the, of his book, we really can empathize with the nature of Nichiren's realization of what his Buddhist practice means. Because as his life becomes more and more unified with Buddhaness, how can he fail to understand himself to be within the very fabric of you and I? And if we're to practice with that kind of cellular conviction, then how could we fail to practice just as he is witnessing his own practice? You could see Nietzsche as this singular person, but he spends so much of his time showing you and I that we are no different that for us, our practice needs to take on this character that he is exemplifying. This is why he is our mentor. He is our teacher. If you ever have any doubts about how you should study, what you should study, how you should practice, with what kind of dedication you should practice, just read, read Nietzsche. He's our roadmap. If you ever feel doubt or you're getting lost or off track, read Nietzschean. You'll get right back to it. This is the great, great, amazing opportunity that Nietzschean provided for us. Shakyamuni foretold that some kind of a Nietzschean would exist in our day. Well, we've got it. We found it. Namu Myo Renge Kyo, my friends. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your dedication, your practice. Thank you for being a Buddhist. Don't forget, like, subscribe, support if you can. Take care of your health. Be kind to yourself. I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now. Yo! Oh.